All right, we're going to look really at choices tonight, and the choices will involve trees in some way. But really what I want to look at tonight is first uh, the original choice. And this is something that we have looked at, Derek has looked at, uh, we've talked several times, and it is that original choice that mankind had to make. And it did involve a tree. What tree? Tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In fact, let's go take a quick look at it. We've looked at this several times. Let's go take a look at it. Genesis chapter 2. Now we know God created uh, over six days, resting the seventh. He made all of creation. Uh, he said, let there be light. He created the atmosphere. He cre brought land out of the sea. He put on it plants. He put fish in the sea and birds in the sky. He uh, made the sun and moon and stars. He created all things. And last, he created in his image man which goes to our kingdom of God study, right? Uh, with dominion over all of creation. And as he did that, he gives man, Adam, one rule, one real choice to make. And that can be found in Genesis chapter 2, verse 16. The Lord commanded the man, saying, first of all, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. So what trees are we talking about? All the trees, right? All the fruit. You can have as much grapes as you want and apples and pears. I, we really don't even know what all those fruits were. Could have been ones we never even heard of. <laughs> we don't know what, but every tree you can eat the fruit of, including the one in the middle of the garden, which was what? Tree of life. It was there as well. You can eat, eat as much as you want, whenever you want. You can eat of all the trees, except which one? Verse 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it. For in that day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So he gives them one rule. And then he sees that it is not good that man be alone. Uh, so he created woman. Eve came along, and uh, then the serpent came along. <laughs> that old devil came along and basically questioned God's command, questioned God's intent. Uh, why did he say you couldn't do it? The question uh, the consequences. And she, using her own perception, saw that it was good to eat, and she did eat, and then gave to Adam, and he ate, and that is when they knew that there was both good as well as what? Evil. They knew how to do good, and they knew how to do evil. And what's the big deal with that? Why is that so important that they knew both good and evil? Now, the serpent said, he didn't want you to do that because you would be like him. Does God know both good and evil? So why is it so bad that mankind know good and evil? This is participation. You can yell it out at home. I won't hear it. You can type it in notes if you like. But why is it so bad that mankind would know both how to do good and how to do evil? Not only could do evil. Not probably would choose to do evil. <laughs> <laughs> would most certainly, in fact, that's what we learn from the story of Noah, isn't it? What do we learn from the story of Noah? Everybody did what was right in their own eyes. So they know good, they knew evil, didn't they? That's what this tree gave them the ability to do. This was handed down, that they knew how to do good, they knew how to do evil, yet which did they choose all the time? Evil. It's what we do. If we have a choice between the two. That's why when God knows good and evil, what's the difference? He can't do evil. <laughs> so it's not even, you know, he, his character, is who he is, he's holy, he's perfect, right? And he cannot. So he knows the difference and he has the power, the, the omnipotence to not do evil. Unfortunately for us, from the day we ate that apple, as Paul talks about in Romans, we have a battle going on, don't we? 
Even as Christians, we've got a battle going on that says, I in my flesh want to do evil. But I also have the Spirit of God in me that gives me the strength to do what? Good. So this is a problem. So how many would agree that we made the wrong choice? This was a failure. Big fat F, right? We failed. Given a choice where there was a tree involved, <laughs> we chose poorly. And we chose to eat. And from that point on, we and all of creation have been cursed. Through Adam, the sin nature was handed down. And really that sin nature is just that knowledge to do wrong and the reality that when we have an opportunity to do evil, our flesh <laughs> is to do what? And if you don't believe that's true, just hang out with kids. They are naturally terrible human beings. <laughs> Selfish, I mean, it's just, it's amazing. I mean, adults can cover it up a little bit. Well, some adults. Some adults make no effort at all. <laughs> but kids, it's almost an innocence in their evil, right? And their selfishness and all the other things. And it's in our flesh now. And it's handed down, that curse is handed down from generation to generation. The only person born of woman that was not touched by that curse is who? Jesus Christ. Did Jesus Christ, though, know to do good and do bad? Did he know both as a human being? But he's also who? God, who was powerful enough, omnipotent enough to do what? To not sin. Tempted in every way as we were, yet without what? Sin, and without that sin nature. Okay? So, we failed at that tree. Let's go look at another tree. Let's all go to Luke chapter 22. And this occurred to me while Derek was speaking last week. So, I was kind of excited about being able to talk this week. I was like, hey, this is a cool idea. I'm going to flesh that one out. And by the way, let's get to that phrase right there. Because if I hear one per per person say, let's flesh that out, I want to hit somebody. <laughs> See, there's that evil coming out. It's flesh it out. You add flesh to it. You flesh it out. Anyways, I digress. <laughs> I'm not saying that either. We're going to flesh this out. I was able to do that this week. Let's go to Luke chapter 22, and let's go to the tree. And this is kind of the second tree of life, right? When Adam and Eve sinned, they knew good from evil. And, in fact, you heard God having a conversation with himself because Trinity. <laughs> and they said, let's not allow them to get back in the garden and go eat of the tree of life. And by the way, just my own opinion on that, why that would have been bad, because basically they never would have died, yet they would have continually been separated from God because they would have continually done what? Evil. <laughs> so they, they couldn't, they wouldn't see no need for a savior, no need for any of those things. It would have been bad. So had to separate them so they would understand consequences. They would understand death. They would understand their need for salvation, right? So now we come to God's plan for salvation. When did God decide that he would send his very own son, Jesus Christ, the second of the Trinity, to come down and be a human being and die for the sins of the world? Before everything, before he created all things, it was already decided that this was going to happen. They knew what Adam and Eve were going to do, but they also knew that he was going to make a way. It was promised to Adam and Eve that one would come and crush the head of the serpent. It was all the way through the New Testament and all the images and the sacrifices and all the rest that this Messiah, this one was coming through the prophets and everything. He was coming. In fact, Isaiah says that he would hang on a what? tree so think of this as the tree the cross is the tree and let's look at two people who have to make a choice at that tree and those two people are the two other malefactors <laughs> the other two thieves the other two who are hanging there with them and let's see what happened in luke chapter 22 verse 32 
Is that right? 23. I can't read my own handwriting sometimes. I used to have beautiful handwriting. There was a day. And by the way, just in case he's watching, it's all Travis's fault. But that's a story for another day. Chapter 23, verse 32. That'll be much better. And there were also two other malefactors led with Jesus to be put to death. And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified Jesus and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. So this is a picture we have seen so many times where you have the one, think of it as a tree, right? Jesus Christ hanging on one cross in the middle and then on each side, malefactors. Now we know from other accounts in the Gospels that at the beginning of that crucifixion, which one of the malefactors was yelling abuse at Jesus? Which ones said that they were yelling at him, making fun of him, mocking him, saying, hey, get us down from here. If you can do it, it was what? Both of them. And I want you to get this picture in your head that Jesus Christ, the tree of life, right, is sitting there in their midst, and like all of us, as we come into this world, as we come into this, what is our initial response? To reject. To mock. The, even the idea, right? Basically saying, what? I, I'm justifying ourselves. I don't, I, don't, I don't deserve to be here. Come on, get me down. Come on, do this, do that, right? That's how we start. Fortunately for one of them, and hopefully for everybody listening here today, while we came into this world rejecting, he changed his mind. As he listened to Jesus, as he listened to the mocking, as he watched him, as he looked at everything going on around him, one of them changed his mind. Verse 39. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If you be the Christ, save thyself and us. It's almost like that should say, And one of them continued <laughs> to rail against Jesus. But the other one, Holy Spirit working in his life, feeling convicted, seeing who Jesus really is, and what he said and did, what did he do? Verse 40. But the other answering rebuked the other malefactor, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? Don't you realize we are guilty? And that's where it starts. We have to understand, first of all, that we are what? Guilty. We are guilty. And when we come to the cross, when we come to the tree of life, when we come to Jesus Christ, we must realize, like he did, somewhere along that day, he realized, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> I deserve to be here. I have done these things. I deserve to be condemned. But what else did he realize? Verse 41, And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing a miss. We have to realize that he sacrificed. Jesus Christ did not deserve to die like we do. Did not deserve to be separated from God. Did not deserve all that we deserve. We've made that choice, right? When did we make that choice? We've already made that choice, and while we may start out rejecting, we at some point need to realize we are guilty, but God, by his grace, by his love, by his mercy, he is sitting there and doing this, dying for us, right? In fact, what does he then say? One, realizing he's guilty and that Jesus is doing this and doesn't deserve it, is doing it for him. What does he say? And the thief said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. He realized he was sacrificing. He also realized that he was a king. Right? Do you understand that that's who Jesus is? 
He is our Lord and Savior, isn't he? And he came to that realization, and he just was willing to acknowledge that. I'm guilty. You are Lord and Savior. And all he wanted him to do was just remember him. It kind of reminds me of the prodigal son, right? All I want <laughs> is just that my father will let me back, come back and be a servant. That's a good attitude, isn't it? He comes humbly, demanding nothing, but just recognizing who he is and asks him just to remember him. And what did he receive from Jesus? Verse 43. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto you, Today thou shalt be with me in what? Paradise. You're going to be where I'm going to be. And where did Jesus go? Well, when he died on the cross, he went down into paradise. He did not go to heaven. He had not risen to his father yet, as he said, after he rose from the dead. Uh, he went down into paradise. Peter tells us that he went down there and he preached to those who were down there, the ones, it, it would have been David and Moses and <laughs> the whole gang down there waiting for that day that their sins were not merely covered by the sacrifices, but actually paid for by the blood of their Savior. And then they could go and be in heaven with him. And he went down there, and who was there with him? This thief spent the least amount of time in paradise. <laughs> he didn't get to go straight to heaven like we do, but he spent a very little time in paradise, didn't he? And he was able to go and be with his Savior. That's everybody's current choice, isn't it? What are you going to do at that tree known as the cross? What are you going to do with Jesus? Are you going to ignore it? Are you going to mock it? <laughs> what are you going to do? Are you going to rail against it? Are you going to say, hey, why don't you save me? Or are we going to come to a realization that we are sinners? We deserve the judgment of God, but we have somebody who on that tree gave his life for us. Our King, our Savior, our God gave his life freely for us. And are we willing to humbly come before him and just request his forgiveness and mercy? And if we do, then we will be welcomed into his kingdom, won't we? when we pass from this earth. So, that is our current choice. Everybody needs to make that choice. That, is, that choice is a matter of eternal life or eternal death. Where did the other malefactor go? Well, you only assume he, he went into hell. And one day, he will stand before Jesus Christ. The next time he sees him, it will not be on a cross. It will be on a throne. And he will be cast into ever eternal judgment got to make a choice we made the bad choice here are we going to make the right choice here at this tree of life but we also have an ongoing choice see once we do accept Jesus Christ as our savior we're still here unlike the malefactor who died that day <laughs> once we accept Jesus Christ as our savior we still got some living to do don't we and we become a tree Right? We become like a tree. And the real question is, our ongoing choice is, what kind of fruit are we going to produce? The Bible tells us, and we'll get to that in a second, but I just want to highlight this. Jesus said to his disciples that it is God's desire that we bear much fruit. Right? That we be a strong tree that brings its fruit in season. Right? And we need to be that kind of tree, but the choice is ours, isn't it? We're in him, we're saved, but are we going to be a tree that just kind of puts up some measly amount of ridiculous looking fruit? Or are we going to produce great fruit for God? Now let's look at what kind of fruit we're talking about. Let's go to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Let's actually start with the one, the good side. You guys are good news first or bad news first? Which one are you guys? Bad news first? You would. <laughs> Let's do good news first. 
Because I want you to look at this list and ask yourself, is this what I want produced in our life? See the way I said that? Produced? As in fruit? Right? You get, you get. There's not enough people here to laugh, see? So that's the problem. I need some audience. I need some feedback. <laughs> not produced, produced. All right, there's a difference. Chapter uh, 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit, and this is the important part. Again, first we have to make what choice? This one right here. To accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. To recognize, humbly come before Him and seek His forgiveness and receive the mercy that He is freely gives us, right? Once we have that, that eternal life that He provides, then we have the Spirit of God in us. And the Spirit of God, it just becomes a matter of, are we going to let Him? Or are we going to fight Him? And again, Paul in Romans says it is a fight. The Spirit is constantly in there swinging, right? Constantly in our life, kind of like the little cartoon, right? The little angel is saying, hey, do this. Do what is right. You know to do good. You know to do evil. Let's do good. How about that? We actually had this with our kids last night. We did a little quiz. Do they know what the right thing to do is? And by golly, yes, they did. Every single time, they knew exactly what the right thing to do is. Let me ask you something. How many think that they actually do the right thing every time? We don't. So there's a battle going on. But the more we yield to the Spirit, same guy wrote Gal Romans, wrote Galatians, right? Same idea applies. The more we yield to the Spirit of God, yield to His will, the more per these kind of fruit He will produce. And what kind of... How about this for a list? Love. How many would like to have more love in your life? Feeling love? Giving love? Knowing love? Joy. Not just happy, but joy down in your soul. A true joy for life. Peace. Talked about this a couple of weeks ago. We're always going to have storms, aren't we? We're always going to have struggles. We're going to have tribulations. But to be able to have peace through it all, Spirit can produce peace in those long-suffering, patience, endurance to get through life. So many people just want to quit. <laughs> it's hard. But the Spirit can come in and give us that second or third or fourth wind. Anybody who's ever been a runner knows that feeling. It's a great feeling. <laughs> I can't go on. I can't go on. And all of a sudden, it's like, I'm going. <laughs> and the Spirit can give us that endurance, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness. These are all things we need more in our life. That gentleness, that gentle spirit. That goodness to do what is right, to, to do what is good. That faithfulness to be faithful to God, faithful to one another, faithful to our promises, faithful to our word. Meekness, temperance, also known as self-control. Who could use a little self-control? And by self-control, he doesn't mean actually us taking control. Self-control comes from us giving control to who? To God. <laughs> and to be able to do that, Against such there is no law, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. The more we do this, the more we as Christians choose to crucify the flesh, the one that desires to do evil, to yield ourselves to God, the more these will be produced in our life. Well, what's the alternative? Well, <laughs> garbage. Verse 19, now the works of the flesh are clear. You want to know why this world is so messed up? Well, because a lot of the trees aren't even in God at all. They're still out there living the knowledge of good and evil, doing evil. Just choosing to do what they think is best, what is right in their own eyes, what is in the right eyes of the world. Let's face it, if you basically said, I'm going to live my life like they teach on TV or in movies or books or what's acceptable in the society or what is expected in the society, you're going to be a mess. 
In fact, your life will be full of what? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. And those four basically are the four horsemen of bad love. <laughs> right? World says that is love. <laughs> You know, hey, in fact, that's the, they just, you realize they justify all four of those by saying, well, but they were in love. <laughs> yeah, he cheated on his wife, but he was in love. Oh, yeah, he's given over to fornication, immorality, but hey, they were what? In love. Oh, yeah, given over to uncleanness, impurity, perversion, but hey, it's love. Lasciviousness, whatever feels good, do it, right? Love yourself. Boy, howdy. That's a disaster. Can you imagine a world without those things? Where people truly loved one another? Respected one another? Did what is right? How about this list? Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, Variants and emulations, constantly fighting, hatred, hate coming out of their mouth, hate in their actions, constantly debating, wrath, strife, seditions, divisions amongst people, heresies, idolatry and witchcraft, turning to other gods, right? Other ways, other spiritualism. <laughs> Of some sort. And the rest of those? Right here. What's coming out of your mouth? You want to know why there's so much hatred out there? Why so many lies? Why so many divisions? Because they're feeding the flesh. That's when we feed the flesh, that's what is produced. You say, yeah, but that's in non-Christians. No, in Christians too. <laughs> If a Christian who has come to the tree of life, Jesus Christ, and given their life to him, if we still feed the flesh, this is the kind of garbage that's going to come out. Whose choice is it? It's ours. Our choice. What are we feeding? Because what you feed grows, right? What you starve shrinks. <laughs> Anybody's ever been on diet knows that. Less food. Smaller, more food, bigger. <laughs> right? That's the way it goes. 21, what else? Envyings, murders, relationships with others, desires of what other people have, jealousy and envy of them, oftentimes leading to stealing and murders and things like that, drunkenness and revelings. Basically, just checking out and having a party, right? Productive? No. <laughs> but you look at that list, and I always, I always challenge the kids, the next time you watch a TV show, have this list in front of you and just check off which one on that TV show they say is good. <laughs> right? And as we feed those things, we have a problem, don't we? In fact, look, and he ends with, and such like. There's so many more, so many other bad fruit produced from feeding the flesh. Of the which I tell you before, as I also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Those who have not come to the cross, those who have not come to the tree of life, who are living and still in that tree of the knowledge of good and evil and choosing to do evil, they will be held accountable, won't they? How many are thankful we will not be held accountable in eternity for those sins? But let me tell you something. Does God hold us accountable now? Yeah. These are not good fruits. Why would we want these? Nobody on their deathbed is going to sit there and say, boy, I wish I would have fought more. I wish I would have hated more. I wish I would have been angry more. I wish I would have cheated more. No, what does everybody really, really want? Down their heart, because we know. The tree of knowledge of good and evil did not take away our knowledge of good, did it? 
We know what's good. And what's good? Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, meekness, self-control. These, we know these are good. But they can only produce when we first come to the cross. Receive Jesus our Savior and then yield ourselves to the Spirit of God. Right? That's our choice. In fact, let's go to Hebrews chapter 12. Any gardeners out there? Have you ever worked in uh, fruit trees? I did. <laughs> a lot of fruit trees. And uh, there's a reality of the matter. Uh, you have to prune fruit trees. If you want to produce good fruit and large fruit, you've got to prune. Uh, same goes for us as trees. And who is the gardener? God is. And will he prune? Will he, if he finds that we are producing a lot of these fruit, that we are yielding and feeding the flesh, and we got a bunch of garbage fruit coming on, what will the Father do for us Christians? Now, for the world, <laughs> they're those wild, if you were here on Sunday night in Isaiah, they're those wild um, grapes out there, right? They're the ones that are refusing. He will go to them. He will say there's a better way. He will offer them to come to the tree of life, but... If they don't, but us Christians, and he sees us producing bad fruit, he will come after us, won't he? Like a good parent, he will try to prune. He will try, try to correct us. And when he does, look what it says in verse 11 of chapter 12. Now no chastening, pruning, if you will, for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of what? Righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. So that's the one thing. As a tree, it is our choice. And even when he comes to chasten us, do we still have a choice? That's what chapter 12 says. We, we can sit there and we can get all angry. We can fight him. We can kind of lay down and cry and whine because say it's unfair. Or we can yield to his will. Let him prune, let him correct us, let him get us, because it produces what? Fruit of righteousness. Being in the will of God, being right with God, doing what is right, doing what is good. He will do that in us if we let him, right? What's the keys to this? Let's go to John chapter 15. Jesus, as he sat down with his disciples right before he went to the cross, he wanted to explain to them basically this whole concept. They were saved. Judas was not there. <laughs> so the other 11 were there. They were saved. They knew Jesus Christ, but they also knew they were going to go some, through some tribulation. Also, they were going to have to make a choice, weren't they? And he says to them in John chapter 15, verse 4, Abide in me. Earlier in verse 1, it says that Jesus Christ is the vine and we are the branches. We need to stick close to the vine, right? Seek to be in his will. Seek to be close to him. We need to be more like who? More like Christ, right? Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can you except you abide in me. We've got to stay close. And the closer we stay to the vine, the closer we stay to God, the more fruit we will produce, right? The further away we get from him, what happens? Less or none at all? I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. And I like that because basically if we stay close to Christ, who's doing the producing? He is. And we'll produce much fruit if we just stay close to him. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and withered, and men gather them and cast them in fire, and they are burned. They are the ones that said, I believe I am, I, I, but they are, never really were. God will never let us go. But there are those, like Judas, who said he was in Christ, but was he? No. And he produced nothing, except a example, bad example, right? 
What does it say next? Verse 7, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. He will help us. If we need help, ask for it. If you need guidance, ask for it. If you need strength, ask for it. And he will give those things, won't he? Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples, right? So we need to first... Abide in Christ. Now again, once we go to the cross and receive Jesus Christ as our Savior, we make that choice, we are in Christ. But there comes a question of how much? <laughs> are we really bought in? Are we really serving Him? And the more we get closer to Him, the more we abide, the more our life, because let me ask you something, how much of your life is in Christ? Well, I've got the salvation thing down. Kind of like in uh, Corinthians when Paul talks about those who know Jesus Christ. They have that foundation of Jesus Christ, but basically they spend their entire life wasting it. Building with hay, wood, stubble. And then when it's tried by fire, what happens to all the wood, hay, and stubble? Burn up. Are they saved? Yes, but they, they built their life on other things, and they have the foundation, they're saved, but nothing to show for it. But those who build with gold, silver, and precious stones, what do they have? And this is much the same thing. When we know Jesus Christ our Savior, we are in Him, but are we going to stick close to Him? And is every area of our life, is your work life, is your friend's life, is your um, home life, is every area of your life, don't just make your church life, don't just make your eternity life, on Christ, but abide how much in Jesus Christ? 100%, and he will produce what? Much fruit. What kind of fruit? Love, joy, peace, patience, the fruit of righteousness. He will produce those, won't he? In fact, let's go to Psalm 1. What's a good way to do this? To stay close to God. You guys know Psalm 1. Something about a tree. Psalm 1, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Do not listen and get advice from the ungodly. Why not? Because they've made a bad choice. <laughs> and the good choice put in front of them, they've rejected. So why would you listen to somebody like that? They say, oh, it's okay. It's all right. It'll make you happy. It'll be good for you. It's good. Why would you listen to them if they're ungodly? Nor standeth in the way of sinners. Walking in their shoes. <laughs> Standing where they stand. They're sinners. Their life is filled with that garbage fruit. Why would you want to stand with them? Nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Those who mock, like the malefactor. Those who mock and reject Jesus Christ. Why? Why hang out with them? Why listen to them? It's nothing but lies. Instead, you've got to be what? But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. We need to abide in the word, right? Abide in the truth. Truth of the word of God. Stick in there. That'll help us understand when the ungodly and the sinners and the scornful start lying. By the way, you can tell they're lying because what? Their mouth is open. <laughs> That's a good old one. But no, it's true, isn't it? And if nothing else, Christians need to always seek what? Truth. Not what sounds good, not what you think is good, not what you perceive to be good. <laughs> But what is good? According to who? According to God and his word. In fact, he says, those who do that, who abide in the truth of the word of God, verse 3, shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall what? Prosper. That sounds good, doesn't it? Abide in Christ in every area of your life. Make Christ the center of it. Do it to his glory. Do it for him. Abide in him. 
seek his will, and abide in the truth. And sometimes it's hard to find. Where can you always find it, though? In his word, by his spirit. We can always find the truth. Abide in the truth. And if we do that, what does he say? Then we will produce much fruit. We will produce our fruit in season. We will be a tree that is not easily blown over. <laughs> We're not one that will wither, right? And we will be like that. So that is our ongoing choice. What are we doing? What kind of fruit are we producing, right? Are we being fruitful for God? And really, you can look at your life. Is it full of love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, meekness, and self-control? <laughs> If it isn't, you got a problem. Is it full of those other things, which we will not mention again? Well, it's full of a lot of hatred and heresies and things like that. you got a problem, don't you? Clearly you're not doing it right. So we got to be careful, don't we? Produce good fruit. We made the choice here. There were consequences. We made the right choice, I hope, here. Accepting Jesus Christ as our Savior. That has good consequences. Let's make that good choice here. Because here, the consequences can be good or they can be what? Bad. And there's going to be a battle. Flesh is going to keep fighting against the spirit. Feed the spirit. <laughs> Feed that side of your life and produce much fruit. And now let's go to when there'll be no choice. Revelation chapter 22. You say, no choice? That's terrible. That's un-American. This is a good thing. Because there will come a day when even though we do know between good and evil, we will what? Do nothing but good. We will be glorified. We will be truly in the image of God and be able to always do what is right. Why do I say that? Revelation chapter 22, verse 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, and there shall be no more, what? Curse. What is the curse? Well, the curse came from choosing to eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It was that we knew how to do evil, and that's what we did. <laughs> but now there will be no more what? No more curse. But the throne of God of the Lamb uh, shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him. We will no longer serve ourselves. We will no longer serve our own desires. We will no longer serve Satan. We will no longer serve the flesh. We will serve who? Knowing good and evil, we will always choose good. No more choice. No more tree of knowledge of good and evil. No more sin. None of that ever again. And they shall see his face and his name shall be on their foreheads and there shall be no more night there, no more candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light and they shall reign forever and ever. How long will this go on? Forever and ever. And he said to me, these th things are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which shortly be done. This is going to happen. Behold, I come what? Quickly. Jesus is coming. He will set all things right. We will be glorified. It's all going to be okay. In the meantime, what do we got to do? We already made the bad choice. So what do we got to do? Make that choice first. Come to the tree of life, Jesus Christ. Know him as your Savior. Acknowledge him humbly and receive his salvation. And then every single day, <laughs> every moment of every day, fight this fight. Seek God's help. Pray every day. Lord, help me produce good fruit today. Let me live good fruit. And look at that list. Make that list next, set it next to your bed. As you wake up in the morning, you know, I don't have peace right now. 
What should you ask God? Lord, produce peace in me today. Self-control, I'm struggling with discipline. Lord, give me the fruit of self-control today, right? And even when you lay your head down at night, look at the list and say, hmm, did produce all the fruit I could have today. Lord, forgive me and help me. And what will God do? Forgive and help you go, right? Be a tree that produces a ton of good fruit. That should be our desire, shouldn't it? But that's our choice. And with God's help, we can make the good choice. And have the Holy Spirit produce these things in our life daily.